name, his age, his place of birth, and also his occupation. What did he do during his civilian life? They will examine him, see if they physical fit, but the main thing you have to have is front teeth. If you didn't have front teeth, you can't join the infantry. The reason why it was important to have front teeth is because, according to action, you got to write down a paper cartridge that looks similar to this. This is a paper cartridge. Um, the bottom would have been the projectile, along with 62 grams of black powder. So you use your front teeth to tear the cartridge. Have you ever heard of fight the bullet? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. In the infantry, a soldier is going to be issued a muzzle loaded weapon. And a muzzle loaded weapon, um, you will have your projectiles and also your charge uh, basically separate. Uh, this bag right here is called a cartridge box. This is what a soldier carries 40 rounds of ammo. Uh, I'm also carrying a cap box where a soldier carries a charge. It's a percussion cap. In fact, I can pass this down as well. Um, yeah, the infield percussion is a British company. You have Springfield, you have Colts. Uh, so there's a lot of factories uh, that produce buzz and loaded weapons. Um, and each one of these muscle on a weapon would have had their own bayonet. So this is a infield bayonet. Springfield would have their own bayonet because of us in there to the borough. But um, you're learning the basics, how to do left face, right face, uh, right about face, forward march, uh, company into line, how to do skirmish. They teach them how to do police work, which is called robo duties. You're learning how to do picket. Uh, which is basically uh, keep an eye on enemy patrols. You're doing reconnaissance, which you send out small units going to deeper enemy lines, reporting what you see, you're scouting on foot. Uh, you have them do a garrison duty, which is basically your, your station at uh, town, um, and you basically guard the fort. Uh, you also have them doing fatigue duties, uh, which is basically like uh, digging trenches, uh, uh, piling up earthworks. Um, on the field. Um, you also have them carrying uniforms, cleaning their programs, uh, sewing up their uniforms. Because in the field, you know, you're going out there, you know, you stand out there for months, and it may be a while for you to get supplies. But uh, soldiers, uh, when it comes to USCT, uh, you have the same issue uniform as the white troops. Um, the uniform you see me wearing is the federal issue. I'm wearing brogans. Uh, which they never had a problem with. Um, that was the first thing issue. In the infantry, you're marching 10 to 15 miles a day. So shoes is very important to have. You have to take care of your feet. Uh, the ladies use sky blue trousers will come with suspenders, a cotton shirt. I'm wearing a civilian cotton shirt. Um, I'm wearing a petite blouse, which is called a sack coat. And as you see, I'm a rank of a corporal. A uh, corporal is between a private and a sergeant. But a corporal would have the same pay as a private. My job is when we do uh, guard duty, what we call picket, relieve um, soldiers and replace them for another. So that's my main job. And also, uh, my job is to keep the men in line that's beside me when we in formation. Um, so, uh, everybody has a, a duty. Each one of these ranks have a specific role. A sergeant is a supervisor. In a company, there's going to be more than one sergeant. Um, you would have the first sergeant, and you have four other sergeants. Second sergeant, third sergeant, fourth sergeant. Um, so everybody had like different roles. Um, in a regiment, uh, when you're going into a, a battle, um, there's going to be more than one regiment on the field. Three to five regiments, they call it a brigade, which is about three to five thousand troops. and uh, Three brigades makes a division, which is about 15,000, and two division makes a corps. So going into action, um, the soldiers would be in the position of shoulder arms. This is one of the main positions. Um, we also have right shoulder shoulder arms. Shoulder arms. Order arms. So you, you have these weapons in different movements. And, uh, different roles at times. Um, going into action, uh, the enemy is about a thousand yards marching towards you. They also would give you the command of load. 
So the first step, you place the weapon in front of you, reach for a paper cartridge, tear the cartridge with your front teeth, pull the black powder down the muzzle at the same time, you're going to push down the projectile. Next, draw a rammer, ram down the projectile, and you want to return rammer. You tee your feet, you, uh, you're just going to close so just tee their feet because you want to leave space for the men beside you and also the man behind you. Pull the hammer back and you're going to reach for a charge. Place the charge right where you right draw the nipple. Um, the weapon is basically ready to fire. So once the officer gives you the order of ready, aim. You aim down your target. And once he gives you the order to fire, you will pull the trigger. The hand will hit the percussion cap, detonate the black powder, and it's going to push the projectile off the barrel. So soldiers are trained to fire three rounds in one minute, but it's going to take about 20 seconds uh, at least to load each round. Um, it's not really a long time, uh, but if you practice a hundred times a day going through the motions, uh, a good soldier can load, you know, more than 20 seconds. Uh, but the weapon that the cultures mainly used was the bayonet. This who wins the most battles. The hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, this right here, um, down the weapons at the fence, um, to the United States call troops, very familiar with them. This is a spear. Um, these call troops are grandchildren of West African warriors and Native Americans. Um, so this was designed to penetrate, to thrust. If you look at the design of this anger band net, the deeper you go in, the wider the cut's going to get. It's going to be difficult for a surgeon to sew your wound. So most people, you know, die when they sit. Not too many people uh, survive very negligent But um, this weapon was so deadly that after the Civil War, they were bad knees. They were the only to use these type of bayonets. They were used to straight blades. Um, and the, uh, this is the infantry weapon. Um, in the cavalry, which is soldiers mounted on horses, there were seven colored cavalry regiments organized in the Civil War. And they're issued repeat weapons. Uh, weapons that can fire more than one round. Uh, it was reported that the United States Colored Cavalry issued a weapon called a Spencer that can fire eight shots in 20 seconds. But they didn't want to issue that weapon to the whole time. But the cavalry was issued carbon weapons. Um, the effective range will be that will be uh, 100 to 200 yards at least. But still, musket is a good and effective weapon. It has a further range. Um, there also artillery. You have men uh, operating with big guns, the far over loud. You have light artillery and heavy artillery. Um, different light artillery is going to be um, moving around the battlefield, but heavy artillery is going to be um, in a specific location. You're pretty much protecting the line. Uh, they would just call the juggernauts of the battlefield. Um, like earlier we mentioned about the pioneers, um, soldiers that were clear roads for the um, dig up trenches, build fortification, um, bridge. Um, they what you call today's military engineers. And you had young men serving as drummer boys. They what you call today's military radio operator. Um, a drummer boy, the average age is about 14, 15. And uh, we had some uh, younger that served. But his job is to memorize 100 different codes to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, I want to end it by saying this. We now began 200,000 cultures fighting. There's 1,500 Hispanics. There's Native Americans fighting. There's Hawaiians. Many from the Caribbean islands. You had Canadians that came down, fought. Uh, there were large numbers of Europeans that came over. Uh, and they were holding their own regiments. And there were 58 Chinese there. So you look at one of the early modern wars. Um, you also had women in these camps serving as nurse spies and agents and women as having some soldiers. Everyone paid a role in time and the story was that not the history books. Um, so we thank you. Uh, I believe so. We also talk about him in the military section. Uh, where I call from the 29th Connecticut. Um, he was from Louisiana. Uh, and I'm also interested in learning more about his story as well. But we also have two photos uh, of him enslaved and rags, and also when he uh, actually freed himself, um, when he joined the federal service as a drummer boy, so you can see the difference compared, you know, since he was free.
Yeah, but, but the Emancipation Proclamation is not freeing. They, they, a lot of times in history, when they explain it to students, at high, you know, whether you're in you know, high school, college, wherever, you know, they, they like to put things in key, uh, kind of key words, easy phrases, try to explain to people what's going on. But nothing in history is that simple. There's always several layers to it. And so the Emancipation Proclamation is not freeing those in, in the United States. Okay. It's an executive order, so it's a temporary practice, uh, you know, during the Lincoln, uh, the Lincoln administration. And what it's doing is it's saying those who were enslaved in areas of rebellion, we we will we will uh, provide emancipation for them. Okay, but the, they always have that kind of that extra word at the bottom of the, the page for the for the uh, the purpose of helping them to save the union. Okay. So it's, it's not really a, a moral action as much as it's a military action. When they announce that Emancipation Proclamation, its purpose is to help create organizations like the Bureau of so the When they announce that Emancipation Proclamation, it's not because, uh, oh, we have to free these, these poor, enslaved African Americans. They're doing this because it's a military necessity to, to, to free those who are so, okay? Uh, so we, we need to do this so we can we can add that 209,000 African Americans to the United States military. We're doing this to create chaos among the slave based economy, okay? We're, we're also doing this because the Civil War is not just an American war. <coughs> we're doing this because it's a war. Uh, we, we would talk, you know, many times about how uh, Europe, especially the United Kingdom, is involved in the Civil War. A lot of people don't know that. Did you guys know that? Yeah. So Britain, they have a railroad that's coming through Canada. And they're bringing resources uh, to support the Confederacy. They're bringing it and bring it to the Western frontier. But they're not just supporting one side of the war. They're mainly supporting Confederacy, but they're, they're supporting both sides. I mean, this is evident of this. What, what, what's the name of this? Oh, this is an 1853 British Enfield. So, and he's federal service. So we have weaponry and other resources that are coming from Europe. And the whole purpose of that is war equals money. Okay. Right. It's a big business. It's a, it's a, it's a big business. So what, what's going on is Britain is, is sending weaponry to both sides of the war because they, they figure whatever the outcome is going to be, we'll probably be able to benefit from <coughs> We want the Confederacy to win because we want those resources. We need the cotton. We need the rice. We need all of those you know, uh, agricultural resources to help build up our industrial relation over here in Europe. Okay. And at the same time, they're, they're saying, we want to kill two birds with one stone, because if we get the resources and we aid the war effort, then the United States kind of crumbles. They're an economic competitor in the industrial revolution. Okay. So just kind of bringing it back full circle to the Emancipation Proclamation, <coughs> does, you know, those are kind of some of the things I highlight when I'm discussing that. You know, because there's this misunderstanding that Lincoln, the administration, the government, the military, what have you, and just for a moral reason. This is done for a military, it's a military tactic. You know, everything when you read the Emancipation Proclamation says that. Like in the actual document, it, it, it doesn't say a full state. If you go to a state like Louisiana, it says that there are certain parishes that they allow enslavement to continue, mainly around New Orleans. You know, some historians will say that the reason why that happened is because they occupied that, the federal service occupied that area first and there was a need to make any changes. But there are other historians who say the reason why enslavement had to continue is because that was a pillar that was holding up not just the southern economy, but the economy of the United States. Okay. So they strategically picked certain areas to allow enslavement to happen. Okay, and that's what's going on in the emancipation problem. I mean, this wasn't just this one document. We had two documents. We had the 13th Amendment. See, if you didn't have the 13th which, which after the uh, Emancipation Proclamation that did its part, because of what did it, what did it do? Uh, it uh, kind of nullified the Fugitive Slave Act. So now, if you run a thousand miles to get to Detroit, and the slave catchers are, are there, and Judges and police are required to, to free, send you back. 
Yeah, with the children of war for those future amendments. Because it wasn't law until the laws that you talked about. Until the 13th Amendment. Yeah, 13th Amendment. Okay. So uh, what, what, what was to happen is that, or uh, well, what happened then, is that they kind of smoothed the road for anybody who could get away uh, would not be turned back. That's one group. And then there's another set of people who they call contraband. Who, who served with the, with the army alongside it. And then there's another one who, those people who were suitable, found suitable, were allowed to join the uh, United the Army and the Navy. So it had more than one function. And so, uh, as you're saying, uh, people will argue and say, well, maybe he was racist. He didn't free nobody. Okay. And, and, uh, but you have to look at the whole Yeah, it's yes thing. and no. It's, it's, it's both. But, 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 but without Lincoln in the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment, but would this be the yeah. Confederate States of America now? Yes. I mean, let's think about it now. We got, we, we're barely making it. He, Lincoln couldn't do the Emancipation Proclamation until he won the war. So he's barely making it. So now you get a, a, a quarter, you know, 200,000, almost a quarter million extra people, no matter whether they were fighters or building, whatever, you got a good chance of winning. So. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation helped those people who were enslaved to free their own people, our own people. Because we might still be under the Confederacy otherwise. Are you familiar with that term, contraband? You ever heard that? Yeah. The Emancipation Proclamation right. well, gives us permission, gives the federal service permission came over to seize the property from the South. We were the property. Mm -hmm. So that's what contraband is a legal problem. That's right, that's right. They pushed us out of the power and then they come back. I need to get a picture. There's two other pictures now. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I want, I want, I want to, uh, uh, I, this is, I don't want to turn this into a lecture at all. Okay. This is a museum. Y'all know what museums are, right? Yeah. We have artifacts and documents and things like that. We want you to see those before you go home. I tell my guy, I said, this is a five-minute presentation. Okay. Not a 45-minute presentation. <laughs> okay, now, I'm the other one is Oscar Leftridge. I know, I know a person named Leftwich. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not, not a lot of this, this is one particular part of right here. I want you all to see these because I want everybody to get jealous. Start looking at your family tree to find your soul, okay? <laughs> all, right. all right, and then the other one is, is uh, this is, this is Marshall, this is just a left right here. After you go through this exhibit, you know, well, somebody's going to walk you out into the memorial so you can see this old name. Y'all saw it already? Yeah. 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 She showed it. Oh, yeah. All right, all right, that's good. All right. All right. All right. So you already took it, I took it by then, showed it to them. Well, let me just say, you know, these are just named on the wall until a family member shows up. And they tell us about the soldiers. They actually know more about them than we do. We know, we know what's in the official government records. That's what we got names from. But the family members got the stories, they got the photographs. Somebody kept this in their heart all these years. Y'all know what? Everybody got somebody like that in their family. Don't you? I had a aunt named Cleveball. She had a trunk. Well, that never papers and pictures. She had everybody in <laughs> Uh, so, thank God for those people. And you know, the big museum that they have downtown, they actually took a lot of these documents and put them in the museum downtown. But I can tell you all right now, most of them are still at home in the bosom of these families, in the trunks and suitcases and bags. And some days, I'm sure I'm going to turn them some of them over to us. So, congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
We'll be right back. 